Grayscale's uh, premium over NAV uh, for the for the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust went away, turned into a discount. In the second half of 2020, that was the largest buyer of Bitcoin. Uh, they were a massive buyer, bigger than MicroStrategy, bigger than any other buyer. Grayscale announced plans to convert its popular Bitcoin Trust into an ETF. Grayscale's Bitcoin Investment Trust has more than $30 billion in assets under management. It's up more than 65% year to date, but it has trailed Bitcoin this year. Hidden headwind could put some pressure on the price of Bitcoin. JP Morgan pointing out the pending expiration of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust lockup that could send the crypto even lower. As long as there were no tail risks of like counterparty issues or something, they would, you know, they would end their Bitcoin short they would uh, sell their GBTC and they would extract that premium. Also, only a tiny percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy the video, consider subscribing. It's free and you can always change your mind. Enjoy the video. Can you start off from the very beginning by helping everyone better understand why you think we just had a 55% correction in, in Bitcoin price from the recent highs? Uh, so I think there are a, a bunch of different reasons, but I think one of the, the largest reasons and one of the most underreported reasons uh, was the fact that Grayscale's uh, premium over NAV uh, for the for the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust went away, turned into a discount. And so if you, if you look at that fund in the second half of 2020, that was the largest buyer of Bitcoin. Uh, they were a massive buyer, bigger than MicroStrategy, bigger than any other buyer, the, the sheer amount of coins they sucked up. Uh, and part of that was natural demand. People want Bitcoin exposure, so they buy it in their brokerage account through GBTC. It's an imperfect vehicle, but they, they relied on that. Uh, but two, a lot of that was a, a, a neutral arbitrage trade. So someone could, uh, accredited investors could buy into the, the, the fund at NAV, uh, which basically took liquid Bitcoin, converted them into that fund, made them uh, uh, illiquid Bitcoin. So you had a, you know, basically off of exchanges into their cold storage. Uh, and then they would, they would go and short Bitcoin elsewhere. Uh, and then after six months, when that lockup period ended, they, you know, they could sell their, their GBT shares for the market price, which was generally trading at a premium over their NAV and they bought in at NAV. And so regardless of what, what Bitcoin's price did, as long as there were no tail risks of like counterparty issues or something, they would, you know, they would end their Bitcoin short, they would uh, sell their GBTC and they would extract that premium. And it was essentially a risk-free trade. And they could do that every six months. They could take, they could take that capital and do it. And whenever they finish the trade, even though their positions are off, those Bitcoin are now permanently in, Bit in, in Grayscale's Bitcoin trust because that's not a redeemable fund. Uh, so other than, you know, potentially selling some Bitcoin in order to uh, pay the expenses, uh, Bitcoin never really leave. It's kind of a, a, a Hotel California of Bitcoin. And so that was a that was a really big contributor to Bitcoin's price going up. And when we, you know, so we had some increased competition at Grayscale. So we had uh, a Canada's Bitcoin ETF. Uh, we just have generally more ways to access it. So there's a Skybridge fund, right? So there's, there's institutional, uh, basically custodians. Uh, more people are able to just use things like Coinbase or use other major exchanges, right? So we've seen their numbers go up. Uh, and so there's basically fewer people that, that really need to rely on, on say, GBTC trading at a premium over NAV and 2%, you know, fee or whatever it is last I checked. And so basically that with that discount gone, that that neutral arbitrage trade can't happen. And so that the biggest buyer just switched off completely. It hasn't been buying Bitcoin. And so if you look at, say, when they're when they're buying went flat, uh, we've had some pretty significant consolidation of the Bitcoin price. And then when you get things like, you know, Elon Musk backtracking on, on you know, his, his views on Bitcoin being ESG uh, or, or some of these other things like the, the Chinese hash rate migration, which can cause, you know, potentially forced selling or disruptions. Uh, any of these other things can then come and impact it. Uh, but I think, you know, part of the underlying thing was essentially that just, you know, one of the big sources of demand dried up and therefore the, the market had to rebalance itself. Yeah, I mean, now GBTC is negative, right? And so yes. it's it's actually gone the other way and that trade dissipated. And as you said, that's how a lot of the yield that was being offered in the markets was 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 being offered. How much do you think the leverage played a played a role in that? Oh yeah, definitely. That, that's a you know once once those underlying fundamental factors basically, you know, just triggered less demand, when you started to have prices going down, definitely those liquidations, those those big leverage positions uh, were another big factor, along with Tesla, along with these other kind of, you know, uh, headline news. Uh, and so they exacerbated the moves. And then therefore, if someone was, say, a momentum investor and they're watching a negative price action, they might get out or, you know, they might not buy when they otherwise might have bought. Uh, and so that that triggers everything until you have people come in, kind of the buyers of last resort and say, no, I'm, I'm fundamentally long term interested in this network. I think, say, 30,000 is a great price. And so they, they come in and, and kind of 
try to hold a floor. And so lately in the past, you know, few weeks has been kind of testing this this floor area and we'll see how well it holds. But yeah, leverage was certainly one of the big factors as well. I'm curious, you're talking about GBTC and you sort of touched on the fact it was the only vehicle for a while, right? If you wanted to invest in your IRA, you need to buy GBTC. If an institution wanted to gain access, maybe they weren't allowed to buy the underlying asset, but they could buy GBTC. Does the fact that uh, GBTC, that, they, that Grayscale skipped not buying and that we've seen uh, this price action, do you think that's an indication that perhaps institutions were less excited or are now more hesitant than we believed them to be on the run up? I, I think it could be, but I think, you know, I think the bigger story is that just the fund has more, um, you know, competition now. Uh, right. And so if you look at, if anyone's familiar with say equity closed end funds, uh, they often do trade at a discount to NAV. That's basically, you know, the market's way of kind of, you know, factoring out the expense ratio of the fund, which tends to be higher than say passive ETFs, for example. Uh, and so if a, if a closed end fund has a 1% fee, uh, it might trade at a 10% discount to NAV. And so you're basically factoring out 10 years worth of, of, the, of the management fees. That's pretty common practice in the, in the space. And, and so it's actually pretty uncommon for these funds to trade at a premium to NAV. Right. Uh, and so, but, but, but Grayscale was because it was such a unique product. It had such, you know, alpha to it. Uh, and so it was the only game in town for a while. And so actually kind of the natural state is to have roughly zero or, or a slightly negative discount to NAV. Now, I think, you know, when it, when it reached as low as like almost 20%, that I think that's excessive. <laughs> that's, that's pretty uncommon for, for yeah. closed end funds to do. Uh, so there's, you know, there's still kind of an arbitrage trade where if it ever gets really low, uh, it, it tends to probably be, you know, a trade where you want to maybe go long that fund. And then, you know, if you're trying to make it neutral, then you can short Bitcoin. Uh, and so you, until that kind of that that compresses a little bit, but overall, I think that you know the grayscale Bitcoin trust going into negative, uh, you know, uh, under NAV isn't necessarily tied to institutional interest. Uh, you can right. have that go negative while there's still interest in other products. Yeah, and then when it goes extremely negative, then you have that mean reversion trade, to, exactly. just assuming that it's going to come back. Of course. So how much of a how much of a concern then are the future GBTC unlocks? Because now that they're not buying, and we know that uh, price has dropped, and people are going to you know have their their six month unlock happen soon. What does that mean for the market? Uh, so that that's certainly a volatility event. I mean, you know, basically because the Bitcoin is not redeemable from the fund. Uh, it, it, you know that, that it, it's a little bit different dynamics than say if, if if they could just kind of redeem Bitcoin or, or basically if, if Grayscale had more of a mechanism to to sell Bitcoin. At the current time, the only way they sell Bitcoin is they they they're gradually drawing down their Bitcoin from manage you know from paying their expenses. But that's at a two percent rate per year. But I do think the lockup periods can add a period of volatility. Uh, but I think you know as far as Grayscale is concerned, I think the primary damage is done. Uh, there and so I'm, I'm kind of looking at other factors like say the 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 the, the Bitcoin uh, mining hash rate migration uh, as well as you know anything else on the on the ESG front or the regulatory front those are factors that I think could, could move price a little bit more then I'm also just watching the underlying you know network is uh, uh, build out like the things that are happening in the Lightning Network things that are happening in El Salvador the different partnerships that firms like NYDIG are doing with banks to to make it you know more access points for the protocol things like that.